Dear viewers, ladies and gentlemen, participants in the discussion, Your Excellencies, I am Danilo Lubkiski, and I am happy to welcome our viewers and their participants on behalf of the Kyiv Security Forum. On the 8th of May 1945, the Nazi German command surrendered unconditionally to the Allied forces, and that was 75 years ago. Today is the day of the end of the war in Europe, the day of victory of Nazism in Europe, the day of remembrance for millions of innocent people who died. More than 100 million people fought in the war and from 50 to 80 million people died. For us, this war began in March 1939 during the fight for the Carpathian Ukraine. The war passed through Ukraine twice and uh, killed from 8 to 10 million Ukrainians. 6 million Ukrainians fought in the Soviet army. 100,000 fought in the Ukrainian insurgent army. 250,000 in the armies of the Allied forces. Poland lost around 6 million people in this war. About half a million Lithuanians and half a million of Latvians perished. In Europe, there's not a single nation which would not lose uh, its people during the war. Millions, millions and millions of human lives. Today, the Kyiv Security Forum dedicates its discussion to the tragic consequences of the Second World War. And we're going to speak about that through the prism of uh, the new international reality. 75 years ago, the war ended. But there's another war going on, the war for democracy, independence, and freedom of nations from foreign aggression, the fight for an equitable world order, the fight against imperialism and chauvinism, the um, aggression of Russia against Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova against its neighbors, and the West is also part of this ongoing war. Are we able to establish a true and lasting peace in Europe? How can we counter the aggression of authoritarianism and disrespect towards others? How can we establish peace in people's hearts? And this is um, what the Kyiv Security Forum would like to discuss today with uh, very respected and important participants. I'd like to thank each and every one of them. Today with us uh, we have His Beatitude Svetoslav, head of the Greek Catholic Church of Ukraine, Mrs. Vyara Vika Freiberger, the sixth president of the Republic of Latvia, Mr. Vitautas Landsbergis, the father of renewed independence of Lithuania, the first chairman of the Council of Saudis and the first president of the independent Seimus of uh, Lithuania, Mr. Jan Tambinski, well-known Polish and European diplomat and former head of the EU delegation to Ukraine, and Mr. Arseniy Yatsenyuk, Prime Minister of Ukraine in 2014-2016. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to start off our discussion by my question to Mr. Arseniy Yatsenyuk, the founder of the Kyiv Security Forum and the founder of Open Ukraine Foundation. Today there are two major narratives when we speak about the memory of the Second World War and the analysis thereof. One narrative is the humanistic European narrative about the happiness and joy of life and the sorrow for millions of lost lives. But there's another narrative, imperialistic one, which was which is preferred by President Putin. They say that Russia would have coped on their own during the war and they can repeat it if need be. Does the modern Russia have the right to privatize the victory in this Second World War? Or do we have to remind the world about the contribution of all the nations into the victory over Nazism? Can this truth counter the imperialistic fakes which the Kremlin 
is weaponizing in a bit to rewrite history in their own interests. It is my great honor to take part in this panel. Your Beatitude, Presidents, Your Excellency, the topic is very important and I'm grateful to you that you made time to um, express your opinion to the Ukrainian audience. The day of victory in Europe, the day of liberation, and the day of the end of the largest drama and uh, tragedy of the last century. This is how we can describe the 8th and for some other people the 9th of May. This war was unleashed by two tyrants, Hitler and Stalin. This war brought about the biggest tragedy into the families of tens of millions of families in the last century. This war demands the truth about itself, the truth about the ordeals, and the trials and sufferings which were inflicted upon people by two inhuman dictators, Hitler and Stalin. The truth about the fact that on the territory of the Soviet Union not 27 million people perished the way the Soviet propaganda maintained, but 41, and out of those 41 million, about 10 million were Ukrainians. The truth about the fact that tens of millions of people died in that war, that about, about 6 million Jews were destroyed during the Holocaust. And this truth should sound loud and clear for today's and future generations. And no one has the right to rewrite this history, much less to use this history in their own political ideologies. Vladimir Putin, and by the way, his regime is the uh, successor of the Stalinist regime. He's trying to twist around history and to use this tragedy to his narrow political ends. And it was Putin who disrupted the world order for the first time after the Second World War by illegally annexing the Ukrainian territory of Crimea and sending his troops to Donetsk and Luhansk. The war, which ended 75 years ago, came back to the Ukrainian land. Just think about this paradox and the tragedy we are facing. Those with whom we fought together against the Nazi Germany, Russians, attacked us and started grabbing our territories. Why do I use the word truth? I'd like to share one anecdote with you. It's a very, a very old story. I was a student of secondary school number nine in the city of Chernivtsi. We had a history lesson, but there was a substitution because the history teacher couldn't make it for some reason. And in the uh, geography class, there was um, a lesson on the Great Patriotic War. And the teacher who came to substitute our teacher spoke about the anti-Hitler coalition. And she said that it was exclusively the Soviet Union who won in the Second World War. And one, when one of the children asked about, what about Americans? She said something like this, you know, just one American uh, died and he drowned, he wasn't killed. Why am I telling you about this? Thing is, I'm not blaming that teacher. That was the Soviet paradigm. That was the way the Soviet people received knowledge, or to be more precise, lies about what was going on during the Second World War. And when Vladimir Putin said that the USSR would have won over Germany uh, anyway, this is a naked and brazen lie just like uh, what the, the allegation that they would have won without the anti-Hitler coalition, without the US, Great Britain and other members of the coalition. The tragedies of the past should not repeat themselves now. The war ended there, ended there and then, and now the war should end in Ukraine. 
and here we likewise need a democratic coalition, anti-dictatorship coalition, which would tell the truth about the Second World War and put an end to the war which was unleashed by the successors of the Stalinist regime, I mean Russia, and was unleashed against us on our land. That's why our democratic coalition is a prerequisite of, for peace in Europe. I think it's very important, Arseny, that these words are sounding from Kyiv and they are addressed to Vilnius, Riga, Warsaw, and Rome, and Brussels. This is really key that uh, Kyiv keeps reminding about this. My next question goes to his beatitude, Sveteslav, head of the Greek Catholic Church. Your beatitude, the imperialistic narrative about the Second World War is a hymn to militarism. It justifies the idea which is referred to as the grandeur of states, whereby the winner takes it all and has the exclusive right to zones of influence, to dictatorship, and so on. In the imagination of imperialists, this narrative justifies just about everything. We know and we understand that in Ukraine there's no conflict among Ukrainians. There's no civil conflict in Ukraine. Instead, what we have is a Russian war. A Russian imperialistic war and aggression against Ukraine's independence. Putin does not recognize even the identity of the Ukrainian people. Neither did Hitler, by the way. How can we save ourselves from this terror? How can we protect and defend our minds and hearts from this onslaught of imperialistic aggression? Well, first of all, thank you very much for being able to be here together with you in such a highly respected panel to hear each other, to talk to each other and to think together how to build peace together in Europe and in the world. I'll start by saying that any kind of violence, be it physical, mental or even spiritual, leaves deep wounds. When we speak about a war, especially the world war, this is a deeply traumatic experience. After the Second World War, the whole humankind, and in particular Europe and European nations, emerged very wounded and hurt. I'm not just talking about personal or family tragedies or, or tragedies of individual nations. We're talking about certain wounds which are carried as a burden by the entire humankind after th that war, wherever that might be. And how can we today, after so many years, after the uh, Second World War, how can we properly understand the nature of these traumas and wounds, which are still so painful and raw on our European continent? There are two approaches as to what, what's to be done with wounded Europe after the Second World War. The first um, approach was professed by His Holiness uh, Pope John Paul II. And by the way, on the 18th of May, we will commemorate the 100th birth anniversary of John Paul II. So his recipe was to heal the wounds. The wounds which can be treated. And it's only the healed hearts which are able to reach reconciliation. And the way to reconciliation which started off in the Western Europe even before the end of the Second World War between France and Germany and then the Catholic Episcopate uh, continued 
uh, that uh, reconciliation between the German and Polish reconciliation, the inspirer of the Polish-Ukrainian reconciliation was John Paul II. So this is the recipe of how we should heal hearts and build peace. To heal the wounds is the heritage uh, which uh, was bequeathed to us by John Paul II. But there is another approach to poke wounds, to make them bleed, or even more, to use this as an instrument in order to evoke hatred, rage, and confrontation, to make sure that these wounds are passed down as a, as a collective heritage from one generation to another. This is an approach which makes it possible to use this pain in order to build on its foundation new political ideologies, fakes, and to legitimize crimes. And unfortunately now we see that in Europe not everyone remembers the heritage of John Paul II. Not everyone believes that it is important not just to win in a war, but rather it's more important to win over the war, to triumph over wars. And today a lot of people believe that um, legitimization of crimes of uh, Stalinism and uh, communism is possible through the prism of the victory over Nazism and that this is the only possible narrative for Europe. Unfortunately, this idea now is quickly catching on and winning the hearts and minds of people, including among the young people who do not remember the pain of war, but who are very susceptible to revanchist moods and sentiments. So for me, as a shepherd of souls and someone who has to take care of people's hearts, to do everything possible to heal the wounds, for me, it is absolutely crucial to do everything possible and uh, make sure that the day when we mark the victory of a Nazism should not be turned by anybody into a day of propaganda of a new war. Remembering the millions of victims, we would like to ask our Lord for peace, and peace is impossible without healing wounds, unfortunately. That's why we want to heal the wounds. As a matter of fact, I would like to caution today all the political leaders of all European nations from the danger of poking wounds. I remember that uh, Pope Francis, when he visited Kharkiv uh, on the occasion of the European Day of Youth, he spoke about two kinds of memories, positive memory and negative memory. So he said that the negative memory holds only whatever is bad, only the evil. It drags out of history whatever is bad, but whatever is bad in relation uh, to your neighbor, not to yourself. But there is another memory, positive memory, memory which uh, holds the good, the memory which heals, the memory which creates and we would like to see that on the 8th of May the memory of victory of an Arsism should be the day when we can take good memory out of their hearts and this memory will help us to heal, to build, to reconcile so that we in Europe could finally triumph over war so that it would, would never again be knocking on the doors of Georgia or Ukraine or any other country. And we, by our collective positive memory, will say no to any modern neo-imperialistic ideology which will seek to use the pain of people as an instrument of propagating a new war. So help us God. Thank you.
My next question would be addressed to Madam President uh, Vaira Yuki Freiberger. And I thank you, Your Excellency, for accepting our invitation and for being with us today. Madam President, uh, it's obvious that the victory in the Second World War unfortunately didn't bring true freedom to our nations. Latvia lost its independence not even to dream about the independence of Ukraine in those days. Millions of people who had suffered from Hitler then were forced to move away from, from, the, um, uh, uh, from, from the Soviet regime and, and Stalin. Your family has also uh, become refugees. Madam President, uh, your own life is a kind uh, metaphor for, for uh, the revival of Latvia. After many years of exile, you have returned back to home. You, you have re returned back home. Uh, you, you have been elected president of free and democratic Latvia. You have brought your nation to the European Union and NATO. Madam President, if I may, I would like to ask you to share with us your conclusion, your thinking, what you believe uh, is the most important lesson that we have to draw from the from the uh, Second World War in new international reality we live right now, when the international law is almost at the age of being bre break down. Thank you, Mr. President, and you have a slow, please. Ladies and gentlemen, we are commemorating the end of the most bloody conflict in the whole history of the European continent. And heaven knows that there have been a great many of them throughout the centuries and the millennia. But at the same time, on the 9th of May, uh, at least some of us are celebrating another date, and that is the Monet and Schumann Declaration, which started uh, and laid the foundation for what became the European Union of today. And that was, as your Beatitude pointed out, it was a process of reconciliation that allowed it. Uh, these two countries that had had three bloody wars between them, Germany and France, uh, decided to put it behind them. And the main object uh, of their uh, dispute uh, was put in common. And that was the uh, steel and coal agreement uh, between the founding nations, basically, uh, and Germany. But the 8th is a day of celebration for many people in many lands. Uh, as the end of that brutal Second World War, we bow our heads uh, in memory of those who fought bravely under a great many different flags, willingly or drafted as they were, uh, the men in, uh, in Latvia were drafted against the Geneva Convention uh, into both sides, both the Soviet side and the Nazi side, and driven to the front. Uh, to fight in the uh, front lines and to die there. The civilians who were killed deserve to be remembered. And may their uh, suffering and death be a reminder to us that we must do everything in our power to make sure that this is history and that we do not repeat it. Uh, in 2008, when France had the presidency of the European Union, I was asked by President Sarkozy to write uh, a chapter about European security. And in July uh, 2008, um, I, uh, an article was published uh, in which I said, mercifully, the days are long gone when countries do not have to fear foreign tanks crossing their borders and occupying their territories, which is what happened to my country when first the Soviet Union marched in and then Nazi Germany. And uh, little did I uh, realize at that time uh, that these words were going to be made totally obsolete by uh, Soviet tanks coming to within 47 kilometers of Tbilisi and, and later, of course, uh, the annexion uh, of the Crimea. Uh, the unthinkable happened, and uh, therefore we must be we must be vigilant, and we must understand what it is uh, that we celebrate on the eighth, and we should also understand 
what uh, we celebrate on the 9th. And for the rest of you in, in Russia, it may be the fact that Stalin wanted to sign a special uh, separate uh, uh, treaty, if you like, or uh, surrender uh, by the German forces, uh, so that this could be used later as a propaganda uh, and a basis for the false claims uh, that they did it all single-handedly and it's only and by the way uh, he did not speak of Soviet forces which were naturally multinational uh, in those days um, but he used uh, Russian chauvinism together with communist ideology in a, in a very unpalatable sauce that was then being sold uh, to third world countries and developing countries uh, for the next 50 years uh, by the way, the West uh, was, uh, of course, liberated, so many countries had been occupied by Nazi Germany, uh, who recovered their uh, territories and their independence and the possibility to pursue uh, a democratic development. But let us not forget that some of these countries in Western Europe were the possessors of vast colonial territories. And in these territories, if you like, uh, the same principles prevailed um, uh, of the superiority of some nations over others uh, in terms of taking over their governance. The process of decolonization in Western Europe in many ways was necessary for Western Europeans to finally understand how Eastern Europeans who had been occupied and either annexed like the Baltic countries or subdued like the satellite countries how these countries are also being colonized right there under their noses on the European continent and they are not happy uh, with that situation. Uh, they may have been liberated uh, from Nazism uh, and certainly uh, uh, the, the Holocaust and the, and the hideous uh, racism of the Nazi ideology is something that the world was mercifully uh, gladly rid of. Uh, but the uh, chauvinistic and uh, equally inhuman, uh, intolerant oppression of the Soviet regime uh, took over for a large part of the Asian continent and the European continent. And frankly, uh, even as the people are told how uh, grandiose their victory had been over fascism and how exceptionalist they were and how they deserved, so as it were, to rule over others just like, uh, forgive me for saying so, my friends in the West, uh, but I did live in a, in a French protectorate as a little girl and I saw uh, colonialism in its, in its mild and, and benevolent form, if you like, but colonialism nonetheless in action. And uh, it, it did not, uh, it did not really ask the people whether they were uh, accepting or not. It was a deal made between rulers. So uh, the world has a lot to learn from these dates. I think we need to learn history. We need to have objective, um, unbiased narratives to replace the biased, narrow, chauvinistic, imperialistic narratives that certainly President Putin is very fond of. He has become stuck in a time machine. He admits that he grew up on propaganda films um, uh, about uh, Soviet heroism and, uh, uh, and, and I'm afraid he has not, uh, he has not grown up since then in terms of an understanding of what uh, a, a democratic system might mean and what the uh, equal rights of nations uh, could possibly mean. The idea that some nations are privileged, that they must have a sphere of influence, uh, that they can actually question, as they do in the case of Ukrainians. I have heard our arguments uh, to the extent uh, that seems outrageous. There's no such thing as a Ukrainian nation. There's no such thing as a Ukrainian language. So the Ukrainian nation has uh, that task of affirming itself, of showing how well it is able to self-govern. I think the best revenge, revenge that you could possibly have against that sort of propaganda is to establish a state uh, that is absolutely uh, visibly superior uh, to the one uh, that uh, is being uh, built uh, across the border. 
uh, that is a challenge, of course. Uh, it will take it will take time. But that truly that, that is the answer. I think one has to show that a democratic system, uh, a free nation, uh, can achieve more uh, than a nation uh, fed on uh, narrowly uh, uh, chauvinistic uh, imperialistic propaganda, and that grandeur by itself does not feed the people. Uh, grandeur uh, does not heal the sick. Uh, grandeur does not create new discoveries in, in science if grandeur means trampling underfoot other people. I think true grandeur means allowing my nation and your nation and all of us together to develop the best that, that our people and your people can uh, contribute to the welfare, the common welfare of humanity. Uh, I thank you very much uh, on behalf of the Kyiv Security uh, Forum. I thank you very much, Madam President, for your uh, very important remarks. Uh, if I may, if I only may, just to add that definitely we, just following up to your words, that we definitely need strong political will and competence to achieve everything you said. And now, with your permission, I'd like to pass on to the question which I am going to address to a big friend of Ukraine, Mr. Landsbergis, the founding father of the regained independence of Lithuania. Mr. President, it's a great honor for us to have you with us. I'd like to point out that our peoples have very deep-rooted solidarity. Lithuania is a country which very much supports Ukraine. And you were the first who, on behalf of Vilnius, recognized Ukraine's independence. And this is also a very important symbolic and uh, historic gesture and sign for us. So we are very grateful to you for your support. Mr. President, I'd like to ask you about probably the most important thing, which basically follows up on what uh, President uh, Freiberger said. Don't you think that it's only through accession of Ukraine with, to the EU and NATO that we will be able to finally put an end uh, to the war of imperialism uh, against independent nations, therefore to finish the Second World War? In other words, how can we defend our freedom and yours. This slogan, for your freedom and ours, is a very topical notion today. It is very true. The war must be ended. And if European nations or the world democracies are unable to do this, they will perish themselves because there will be no end to war and finally this poor world will destroy itself because increasingly dangerous and destructive means are being used. Therefore, what we are talking about today is what we still refer to as the Second World War. But this phenomenon, which is very frightful and uh, very detrimental, very aggressive, but nevertheless it's, this notion is very blurred and very vague and there are a lot of narratives related to it. Any war should have a beginning and end. And uh, of course now we say that it would be very desirable to see the end to the war. And uh, as regards the beginning of the war, there should also be understanding. And here we're talking about September 1939. This is a bargain between two imperialistic countries. Both of them pretended to be socialist. 
Germany, the German and the Soviet um, seeming socialism and they came to the conclusion that they need to broaden their territories and they colluded um, between themselves and uh, the beginning of the Second World War in um, Europe is um, dated August 1939. The hostilities started on the 1st of uh, September after Stalin ordered his uh, uh, Supreme Soviet to ratify a friendship agreement with Germany because this was demanded by Hitler who wanted to have a free hand attacking Poland. So this collusion was reached in August, on the 23rd of August 1939 in the shape of the Moscow Pact, according to the place where it was signed, it is called the Moscow Pact. It is called Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, but it was concluded between Stalin and Hitler. And both of them thought that they had fooled the other. Stalin was jumping for joy because he thought he had fooled Hitler and Hitler knew that he would deliver a blow against uh, Stalin and resolve the, his problem in the East. So the beginning is uh, pretty much clear, which is not the case with the end, because uh, the politics and understanding of the world development is in a very backward shape, is in a ba very backward condition, sometimes at the level of medieval times, when the rule of force was absolutely supreme. And today's Russia also is a certain this rule of force, as if saying, once we had certain obligations, because we were not very strong, and now we are strong and we don't give a damn about our obligations uh, towards Ukraine, for instance. And the Budapest Memorandum has no force because Russia is strong and Europe is scared. So this uh, very regrettable state of affairs in which we find ourselves and when we speak and, and try to analyze the war, we call it the Second World War, even though it was the continuation of the first one. And it's not the end yet. Maybe there'll be a third one. An all-out war for the world domination. The lands that they claimed and wanted to grab were called by them uh, territories of influence, but those were territories of possession. So this uh, play on words doesn't mean anything be because the agreement on friendship between Germany and the Soviet Union was about how to destroy Poland. And it was agreed that no one would be helping Poland, neither Russia nor Germany, if a war breaks out. And if the time comes for political territorial changes. This is the way they treacherously uh, called and um, camouflaged their plans. They called it changes and they actually redistributed the loot of uh, predators beforehand and uh, they were out to get it. And because of that, a big war broke out, maybe 
Hitler also had some hopes that Western democracies um, would be afraid to stand up for Poland. Because he suggested even in those secret protocols, it was suggested that in, it is not known whether Poland will be existing in the future or not. So they basically thought uh, probably about a certain uh, satellite Poland under the rule of both robbers, as it were. So that, that was their decision. They decided that Poland will be no more and that other countries between Russia and Germany should also disappear from Finland all the way to Lithuania and uh, pieces of Romania and so on. This is what that war was about in terms of uh, the year two narratives that we heard about today, the liberational and uh, enslaving narrative. That as a matter of fact, there was um, very little liberational dimension to that. It was about grabbing, capturing and possessions that was masterminded all the way from the very beginning. It is reflected in their maps and plans and uh, schemes about how they would be dividing the territories. So this is the only um, narrative which is possible here, the imperialistic one. And it is going on. And uh, this war has its beginning that does not have its end. There's no telling when the war ended. People say it's the 8th of uh, May, but that was a surrender of Germany. But it was the purpose and the goal of the war is uh, to capture the whole Europe which is pretty much what um, Stalin envisioned, that was only a stopover in May. A pause. They dealt with one enemy and then they were up to other tasks and uh, objectives with the uh, following redistribution of the world. And the process is still going on. So. In, at the foundation of this war, which is still going on, is the forcible redrawing of the European map. Of course, there was a terrible war in Asia and so on, but everything started in Europe. And we mark this date as the end of combat activities in Europe in May. 1945. Yeah, Jan, I'm happy you are with us and thank you for being for being with us for being with Ukraine. Uh, uh, my question is is not simple. I accept. I agree with that. Uh, uh, what we see in Europe right now, there are a lot of sign of dangerous tendencies that Ukraine is afraid of. Uh, the signs of isolationism, the signs of strongman practices, and, and so on. The the enormous amount of crisis we we face. Mm, they divide Europe, and uh, uh, and this is a big question for us. Is this new reality capable of undermining the foundation foundations of a free, open, and inclusive for Ukraine, for Moldova, for Belarus, Europe um, that we dreamed of? And uh, how to avoid, you think, the um, I would say the attempts to establish some kind of new Yalta agreement between uh, the West and uh, Putin's Russia. This is your floor, please, Your Excellency. I would be happy to hear your answer. Thank you very much, Danilo, and I'm happy to be a part of this distinguished panel. Thank you very much for including me into the discussion. I will start by first making a reference to what uh, Ms. President, uh, Madam President Vike uh, Freiberga uh, and President Landsberg have uh, said, there are two different narratives. In Eastern Europe, there is still a narrative of the 
end of the war, the victory of Nazism, because there was no reconciliation, not only between different nations, but within the nations. In the Western part of Europe, the narrative is more focused on Schumann's day and uh, the reconciliation, peace and cooperation in Europe. These are two different ways of narratives and uh, uh, his bad attitude has set these two different memories. One which is healing, the other one which is dividing and still allowing for further differentiation between nations for hostilities. So let us end finally the war 75 years after. We have to honor all the victims, we have to honor all the people who have, uh, have offered their life for the victory. And from the point of view of ordinary people, it was the uh, end of the war. But on the political side, they were completely different considerations. John Paul II, whom uh, his attitude recalled as well, he was always telling, telling that the Second World War was over only at the age of 80s. But turning back to your question directly, to the question about how Europe is already now operating and what are the moods in Europe, we are living through multiply crisis. And in the multiply crisis, the psychological reaction of people is to look for comfort. And very often, you will find it in all books of psychology, people are ready to offer part of the liberty and freedom in exchange of an insurance of stability and peace. Therefore, all this calls for isolationism, for authoritarian regimes, because they have a kind of pretense to offer you something that gives you comfort. But this is a very dangerous path. And uh, it now depends very much on uh, the leadership, how not to enter in this trap of this uh, very cheap offer for a kind of a comfort in exchange of freedom and uh, liberty. We have to fight this uh, uh, fight not only within Europe, but also with uh, other our neighbors and friends, including Ukraine. This is also a question to turn the cap from the past to the future. Six years ago, Arseniy Piotrovich, who is with us, and I'm happy to see him at least at the screen, signed association agreement in Brussels. A historical moment for Ukraine. How? to be consistent in everyday action with the strategic choice of Ukraine. How to implement the future and allow turning away from the past. We have these wars still in hands, in minds of people. We have to overcome this burden of living always with the head turning back. There's a very good saying of Graham Bell, the inventor of the old telephone, that very often door closes, but other opens. But we are so nostalgic for the old doors that close that we do not see the opportunity with the new door. We have to look to the, into the future. And there is always, even in bad situation, a space for good deeds for good everyday action. And this is something that uh, we have also referred to Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova, as uh, you name it, Russia, to implement what could be done well every day. The action of society, the action of nation is composed of everyday efforts, not of uh, big uh, historical events. They may come one day, but first is to do it every day. And you ask me the question whether we could fear a new Yalta. The new Yalta, it's always on the horizon, 
for many people, it might be this temptation that I referred to, to get a kind of a quasi-comfort by signing a pragmatic deal with others and uh, uh, to eliminate a problem from all the lists uh, of problems uh, that politicians are confronted with. We have to learn lessons from the past. This is not that we can turn the page over the past. We have to learn lessons of appeasement policy. The appeasement policy has had as a consequence the war. There is no way to appease aggression. We have to confront the aggression with truth and with real values. The value of every person. Every person is a subject of politics. And we have to offer to this every person the space to develop its own potential, its own skills, and to live in freedom. And this is how I would uh, suggest to confront the sphere of a new Yalta, to offer perspective for every person to live in a better space for him. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now I would like to address a question to Mr. Tambinsky. Thank you very much, Jan, Your Excellency. Thank you very much for your intervention, for your participation, for making time to be with us. I thank you all for your very interesting interventions. We're coming to a close of um, our discussion, and now I would like to ask each of the participants to come up with the final takeaway that you would like to express and get across to the Ukrainian and international audience, because uh, our audience is much broader than just Ukraine. Madam President, I thank you for, for your remarks. Uh, you are a true symbol of strong political leadership and political will. What would you say, what would you deliver, and what would you tell the Ukrainian audience these days uh, when we commemorate the Second World War and fight against the Russia's offensive? Please, Madam President. I would remind the Ukrainian people to never forget their historical roots, the richness of their language and of their culture. We often speak of nationalism as the evil that led to national socialism in Germany. The two are really two completely different things. Uh, the one is, a, is an ideology of oppression and uh, a perversion of Nietzsche's idea of the Superman. Nietzsche had a, actually an idea of the perfectibility of human nature. I think that we can second him in that, uh, in that, yes, we can make our uh, human nature better. The better angels, as the poet says, of our human nature uh, should uh, take over from the other ones. Um, but nations develop, and they do so by the sense of solidarity, first of all, that comes from nationhood and from a common purpose and establishing um, respect for uh, one's past uh, in its best expression and building a future uh, that is uh, on solid ground, but that does not carry with it uh, the mistakes of the past. Uh, learning from the past, obviously, is a thing to do. Uh, and uh, recognizing, I think, for oneself, every nation has the right to exist, just like every person has the right to live, to breathe, to dream. And what we need is for nations to understand that if a nation dreams of being better than it was before, it must not be a dream that includes oppressing others, but quite the contrary, that we can dream together uh, of a better future for each, for our own nation, for communities of nations who have common goals. And certainly we are part of humanity and we do hope that humanity can get better. Thank you very much, Madam President. Mr. President Lars Burgess. May I ask you to give your main message to the Ukrainian people and the international community, please? 
I very often recall what uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn said as an appeal to people. Live not by lies. And this also relates to our discussion. We should understand this war not by on the basis of lies, but on the basis of facts. Russia considers this war to be their own. They even celebrate the uh, supposed end to that war. Well, this is correct in the sense that um, it was Russia who started this war, and uh, until now, Russia is unable to stop it. And we should clearly see all their attempts of land grabs, which also manifest themselves in a strange situation when today's Russia doesn't even have a treaty and state borders with Estonia, which means with the European Union. The issue is open. Russia from Stalin's times considers itself to be open to enlargement. This is an oath that Stalin made standing by the coffin of Lenin. He said that he would be enlarging the Soviet Union. This is the precursor of the following wars that ensued, because the people who rule Russia still fail to understand that peace is better than war, and peace cannot be gained by force and by imposing your will upon somebody else. There can be no peace unless you have peace in your soul, in, unless you have a true wish and desire to live in peace. So, speaking about this war, we should understand that there is no end to this war yet. The countries which were captured in the course of uh, military actions and peoples, not just the Baltic countries, but Eastern Germany, for instance, they were occupied. And if there are occupied peoples, this means that the war is going on. Well, later, East Germany had a chance to gain freedom and uh, to unite. But the intentions to grab new lands is obvious if we take a look at the fate of poor Ukraine. The war which is being waged against Ukraine by Moscow, by the hands of mercenaries and uh, Russia's proxies, is the continuation of the same war aimed at preserving the empire. When Mr. Putin came to power and uh, established himself within several years, he started clearly stating that his goal is to restore the Soviet Union. He fails to do it to 100%, but the wish and the intention to enlarge his possessions is very much here. And finally, this is the ideology of communism, to possess the whole world. When Russia manages to give up this, it will probably be able to become happier and better off for their own people and for other peoples who are now suffering from this distorted understanding of the goals of, uh, of the state. There can be no goal of ruling other nations and other peoples. Otherwise, it will end up in a world tragedy, which will be even worse than the Second World War. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Ian, your brief message, what would you like to say to Ukraine? 
Thank you. The war gives examples of countless victims, tragedies, uh, and cruelty of people. But war has brought us also examples of huge courage. We need these lessons of courage for peace times. Peace requires a lot of courage. As uh, the famous Greek uh, writer Tukidid has said, the freedom is based on courage. And we need everyday courage to uh, be intellectually open, to challenge all the truths by questioning in intellectually sound methods, to get our own intellectual understanding of what's going around us, including with regard to the past. We need the social courage to care about others, to care about the community we are living in. We need as well this courage of transgressing our own personality and to see ourselves in the context of us community, not only me as the center of the world. And we need courage to take responsibility. This is the huge courage for leadership. So the lessons of courage are not only from war times. We need the civil courage every day in Europe. We need the civil courage in Ukraine. You have fantastic people, empower them to be the master of their destiny. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Yatsenyuk. The floor is yours. Our peoples were enslaved both by the Soviet Union and the Nazis. The Second World War ended, but the freedom of our peoples became possible only after the disintegration of the Soviet Union and the fall of the Berlin Wall. We were subjugated by the Soviets up to 1990s. And by the way, Stalin's successor, Vladimir Putin, in 2008, openly admitted that the Soviet Union had occupied East Germany. This is a, his a fact of history. Then we lived in peace, and then we were attacked. We in Ukraine and Georgia were attacked. We will end this war, but we will end it on terms which are needed and which are advantageous to Ukraine and the Ukrainian state, which is the return of Donetsk, Luhansk, and the return of the Republic of Crimea. We must preserve the most precious achievement which we have in Europe after the Second World War, the European Union, and we should keep it by all our forces, all our efforts and thoughts. Because this is the kind of foundation of the free world and democracy which will help Ukraine regain its territories and which will prevent a repeat of totalitarianism, dictatorship and redistribution of the world which happened during the Second World War and after the Second World War. Vladimir Putin dreams about this kind of picture. But he wants to sit right there in the middle. This is Yalta. He wants to be there as the main new totalitarian leader who divides the world and seeks to regain his spheres of influence, who wants to grab Ukraine, who dreams about subjugating the Baltic countries and the, about the restoration of the Soviet Union. And our task is to make sure that uh, we draw the right conclusions from the biggest tragedy of the last century and uh, from the drama which is being played out in Ukraine now. The European Union is one of the fundamental prerequisites for keeping peace in Europe. Let's cherish and preserve what we have, otherwise it may be too late. Thank you very much. Arseny, and I, I give the floor for the concluding remarks to his beatitude, Svetoslav. I believe that the 8th of May 
2020 would be a very good opportunity to finally finish the Second World War, albeit 75 years after the official announcement that that happened. If we really manage to put an end to the war which is going on in our hearts and in high offices of different governments, we will be able to finish other wars which in one way or another are only a manifestation of the unfinished conflict that we've discussed today. Another point. Only healed hearts are able to achieve peace. Therefore, there is no other way to counter war but to go along the path of reconciliation. And I sincerely wish that we all would be able to contribute to this and uh, through dialogue and mutual forgiveness heal the wounds of the Second World War. And the final point, there will never be peace without truth and justice. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And I believe that knowing the truth about the Second World War and freeing our conscience of the ideological fakes about those events is the way to make sure that we, in peace and justice, resist the war, the shadow which is looming over the European continent again. So may these three points, no to war, heal the hearts and make peace, and the third one, know the truth. May these points be the recipe for us to properly commemorate this day of triumph over Nazism. Thank you very much, your beatitude, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for this most interesting discussion, for your time, for your contribution. Today, Kiev was talking to Riga, to Vilnius, Rome, and uh, in the person of Jan Tambinsky with Warsaw as well. This is a union of nations, of free nations, dignified nations which contributed a lot to the victory which we are commemorating and remembering today. The common denominator of this victory and our existence is yet one more very important phrase. We win when we are together and when we together fight for our freedom and yours, for our freedom and yours. This is today's main denominator in the opinion of Kyiv Security Forum. Thank you very much.